on January 25th, the Biden administration announced that it would be sending Abrams tanks to Ukraine, which is an obvious escalation of this war, something that President Biden said would lead to World War III. Apparently that is out the window. But maybe lost in this whole story is what type of munitions will be used by these Abrams tanks. Remember those depleted uranium munitions that were found in Iraq, which of course maybe led to all sorts of birth defects in Iraq. We're not going to show you the images because they're absolutely horrible, but you can definitely do an internet or a Google search for depleted uranium birth defects Iraq if you want to seek out what those images look like. You'll see what I'm talking about. They're hard to look at. We might be seeing similar scenes playing out in Ukraine before long. Redacted correspondent Dan Cohen has this story. Dan, this is an obvious escalation. What did you find out about these munitions and about these Abrams tanks? Yeah, Clayton. So when these tank deliveries were announced, the White House was asked in a background press briefing if it would be sending depleted uranium munitions. And the senior official that was on the line demurred and said, quote, I'm not going to get into the technical specifics. But a look at the Federal Pure Procurement Register shows two contracts for depleted uranium 120 millimeter armor piercing M829A4 munitions. These are made specifically for Abrams tanks. These contracts were first reported by the Bulgarian journalist Diliana Gaitansheva, who frankly is doing better reporting uh, on, the, on the U.S. than most of or all of even the mainstream media. Yeah, she's amazing. What's is She's she's fantastic and, and doesn't, you know, just doesn't get the credit she deserves. What's especially notable about this is that these contract tenders were listed in uh, October and December, months before the Biden administration had announced it would be sending these uh, 31 Abrams tanks. Um, so it's it's kind of suspicious timing here. Yeah, wait a minute. So these these are the munitions procurement contracts and these were from October. And months ahead of time, we just learned in January, January 25th, as we just said, that they were going to be, and it seemed like they were hemming and hawing on this. Will we send Abrams tanks? We don't think we're going to. We're not going to do this. Let's sort of back and forth. But these contracts predate the, the announcement of the Abrams tanks by months. Exactly. So, yeah, the question in my mind is, was this all planned out ahead of time, uh, even before October, but you know, we there's evidence that these munitions were well, there's direct evidence they were ordered in October and again in December. And then the decision decision maybe wasn't wasn't announced until uh, January. So was this all planned out and kind of slow, um, slowly fed to the public um, in order to minimize public reaction, not only here in the United States, but from the Russians. And we've seen this kind of sort of game where Biden says he won't send, you know, long range, long range missiles because it could be perceived by Russia as a dangerous escalation. And then he does it uh, again and again. Even the New York Times has reported on this, on all of this waffling. But what's amazing, if you look at this headline, they, they uh, about the Biden administration always sending the weapons, ultimately sending them to Ukraine, the New York Times says that Biden does it reluctantly. So, oh, he doesn't really want to. So they're really trying to downplay this and, and kind of, you know, slow roll it as as best as possible. But like, like he's just an Russians, unwitting, he's just an unwitting participant in his own administration. Exactly. I mean, p poor old Joe just, you know, and, and all of his advisors, they don't really want to do it, but they're being they're being forced to because of evil Putin. So it's all it's all Russia's fault. Um, that's that's the message that, you know, we're being given by The New York Times and all of the, the corporate media that is, you know, of course, pro war. Um, but if you look at what the Russians have said about this, they said that they consider sending depleted depleted uranium shells into the battlefield battlefield is a major provocation. Konstantin Gavrilov said at an organization for security and cooperation in Europe forum, um, and this is when the Abrams tanks and the Leopard tanks from Germany were announced. He says, quote, we know that the Leopard 2 tanks, as well as the Bradley and Mardar armored personnel carriers, are armored with armor-piercing shells with uranium warheads. 
Their use leads to contamination of the area, as was the case in the former Yugoslavia and Iraq. In the event that such ammunition for tanks produced in NATO countries is delivered to Kiev, we will consider this to be the use of a dirty bomb against Russia with all of the consequences he follow, that follow. So very stern warning from um, the, the Russians there. And you know the U.S. has really sought to downplay and cover up the long-lasting dangers of depleted uranium munitions for, uh, for soldiers, for, for combatants, but also for local populations who are exposed to this in, in the, the years to come after, after the uh, uh, cessation of hostilities. The U.S. used um, depleted uh, uranium munitions in Iraq in both the 1991 and 2003 invasions. It also, also used them in Yugoslavia and Bosnia and Kosovo in the 1990s. And in 2015, most recently, it fired thousands of shells in Syria in Islamic State-held territory, despite promises not to use it. So there are multiple studies that talk about the effects of these munitions. A 2013 study in Iraq found that, uh, quote, the overall incidence of breast and lung cancer, leukemia, and lymphoma had doubled and even tripled. Jeez. Again, I don't want to show the images of the deformities in babies, but you know you can just look on Google and, and they're everywhere and they're absolutely horrifying. Um, back in 1999, the, the Guardian quoted a research scientist saying that he expects 10,000 extra deaths in Kosovo because of depleted uranium. So there's no shortage of, of evidence. Um, and it seems to me uncontroversial to uh, uh, say that this is extremely dangerous in the long term for the civilian populations in the Donbass, you know, where this will be used, which of course explains why we get this stern warning from the Russian side. Well, that was one of the biggest things that stood out to me upon hearing the news of this is how will this be used against the civilian population? Because to this point, we know that NATO directed HIMARS attacks um, have been hitting civilian populations inside the Donbass. So they're using American Western weapons to attack civilian populations, apartment complexes, hospitals, um, all sorts of uh, civilian residential areas. So how will these be used? I can only imagine that these are going to be used, would be used in civilian populations and what kind of a lasting effect. I mean, we're talking still the, the irradiating effects of these many, many years later in these civilian populations and in Iraq and, and, and Kosovo and these other areas. Exactly. I mean, it's, uh, it's not a secret at this point. And, and we've seen the horror, the horrible videos of, you know, standard munitions that are used on the downtown civilian areas anywhere in, um, in the, the, uh, in the Donbass. And so, you know, presumably that's exactly what's going to happen, uh, with these depleted uranium munitions. And of course the, one of the bigger goals is regime change in Russia. So if this continues to escalate, and Ukraine is launching attacks inside Russia, is this going to be used on Russian territory, which of course the Russians would see as a, as a direct attack um, from the West, from NATO, from the United States. So it's just extremely dangerous and you know, there's no reporting about this. The only, the only report, the only person who, is, who has looked into this is Dilyana Gaitancheva, again, the Bulgarian journalist, and her article is published in Bulgarian and so our corporate press that's beholden to the Pentagon and the military industrial complex doesn't want to look at this at all at all. So, you know, it's basically Diliana Gaitancheva and us at Redacted that are that are going to report on this. And Diliana also was one of the first to really dive deep into the bio labs inside of of Ukraine as well and into, I believe, into Moldova as well. So she she was doing and really got kicked out and bullied and pushed out by uh, by members of parliament um, for doing this reporting. And the, some of the reasons we actually know that this stuff is happening is because uh, because of her work. Some of the only reporting I've actually heard about some of the depleted uranium related to the armor itself and the exo armor that's on these Abrams tanks that they added depleted uranium to the armor back, I think, in the, in the late 1980s. These updated uh, Abrams tanks will not, the ones being sent to Ukraine, apparently are going to have that armor removed from some of the reporting that I've been seeing because, as we've heard from here on the show from Colonel Douglas McGregor and others, they don't want those 
types of weapons to fall into the hands of the Russians, which is ultimately what will happen. So this sort of more advanced leopard armor that's on the leopard tanks from Germany will be sort of downgraded to a lesser tank capability, and, say, and so too will the Abrams tank be downgraded without this uh, depleted uranium armor. But we're not talking about the armor here, right? I mean, we're specifically talking about the munitions that will be used. Exactly, yeah. These contract tenders are for munitions specifically, even though in the background, uh, that White House press briefing, uh, that was, they were asked about the cages, the armor on these, on these um, tanks as well, and, and the White House official didn't want to say, wouldn't say anything um, either way, but only because um, of, of Diliana Gaitancheva finding these um, contract tenders in the federal uh, procurement um, register, do we even know about this? So, um, so you know, that's, that's the, the origin of this story in the first yeah. place. Um, and her, her reporting has on, on the bio lab, she did an incredible documentary where she went to Georgia into the Luger. She was basically checking out the, uh, looking into the Luger research center, um, and, and showing how basically there were, um, biological, um, experiments going on under and, and being transported under the cover of diplomatic personnel. So really recommend everyone, uh, look at her work on that too. So, Dan, we've had a number of experts here on the show saying that it doesn't matter what tanks we throw into the mix, what weapons we throw into the mix, this war is essentially over. Um, all that's left is the drag out rest of this and how many uh, you know, people will be used as cannon fodder um, till this grinds to a complete halt. So it really comes down to how these will be used against the civilian population and what sort of effects these will have. And if you just want to, this is exactly what the United, the, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency says. And I just want to quote this because it's so really disturbing about depleted uranium. It says, if depleted uranium is ingested or inhaled, it's a serious health hazard. Alpha particles directly affect living cells and can cause permanent kidney damage. And again, it's twice or three times the strength of steel. So they're using these, of course, to try to pierce um, Russian tanks and body armor, etc. But how will these be used in the civilian population, I think, is ultimately the biggest concern because doesn't seem like that these are going to have much effect on the battlefield at all. Russia will be very aware of where these munitions are being delivered and go right after them, I would imagine. Yeah, and I mean, and then, you know, another question comes to mind for me is the soldiers that handle them, um, that are exposed to them, what are the long-term consequences for, for, for those, for, for combatants on both sides? Um, there have been, you know, studies about that too. Um, so all around, it's, it's, again, like you said, not going to turn the tide of the war, it's, but it is going to pose um, serious long-term problems for anyone involved, whether soldier uh, or civilian, um, and, and, you know, for the communities who are living in uh, the battlefield and are, and, you know, exposed to this, it's just, you know, could be many years of, of cancer and leukemia and all kinds of horrors. And the mainstream media remains silent on this. Once again, it'll be see, it'd be interesting to watch and see if any corporate media stands up and actually asks a question of the White House press secretary about this more specifically. Um, they, but they won't because they're just uh, stenographers uh, right now. Dan, always great to see you. Thank you so much for this report. We appreciate it. Thank you, Clayton. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.